from now on. We'll give it just a moment. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Well, I appreciate the applause, but I just barely know even how to move the figures. I don't really understand any strategy. But anyway, I'm Kurt Graham. I'm the director here of the Truman Library. Welcome to the Truman Library. It's always a great pleasure to welcome an, an eager audience, and we feel like we're just kind of in some ways getting back into the swing of things here and having uh, some great opportunities in the post-pandemic to get together again as we, uh, as, as we used to and as we look forward to doing uh, again. So thank you for being here and we're just delighted tonight to have this very special program. It's such a unique opportunity for us and, and for all of you, everyone involved, um, to welcome Gary Kasparov to the Truman Library. He's a world chess champion an author and a master of strategy, and, and a great uh, humanitarian, someone who is concerned about the state of the world, and you're going to hear a little bit about that tonight. Someone who's spending his, his fame, his energy, his resources to try and make the world a better place for everyone in it. And I think there are only a handful of people who ever get to do something like that, and I'm very proud and happy to have him here, and it's wonderful to be uh, associated with him even in these uh, brief contexts. Uh, Gary is the author of three books, uh, How Life Imitates Chess, uh, Winter is Coming, Why Vladimir Putin and the Enemies of the Free World Must Be Stopped, and Deep Thinking, Where Machine Intelligence Ends and Human Creativity Begins. He's also a contributor to many publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, and the New York Daily News. He was born in Azerbaijan in the Soviet Union in 1963. By the age of 12, he became the under-18 chess champion of the USSR. At age 17, he became the under-20 world champion. he became the youngest world chess champion in history at 22 years old. In 2005, still ranked number one in the world, he retired from, the profession, from professional chess. In 2012, Kasparov was named chairman of the New York-based Human Rights Foundation which promotes individual liberty worldwide. Um, he knows a little something about the importance and how precious individual liberty is because facing imminent arrest during Putin's crackdown, he moved from Moscow to New York with his family in 2013. In 2017, he founded uh, the Renew Democracy Initiative dedicated to promoting the principles of the free world through education and advocacy bringing together leaders and representatives from across the political spectrum, RDI has become a leading voice for political reform and standing up for democratic values against authoritarian regimes and influences worldwide. In 2022, in response to Putin's all-out invasion of Ukraine, Kasparov co-founded the Russian Action Committee. The committee uh, has published a plan for a Russian transformation to a parliamentary democracy post-Putin including abandoning all claims on Ukrainian and other foreign territory, uh, reparations to Ukraine, accountability for Russian officials, and the decentralization of power inside of Russia. Of course, that's just on the side. I mean, he's known as the, as the chess guy. The U.S.-based Kasparov Chess Foundation is a nonprofit that promotes the teaching of chess in education systems around the world. And I'm delighted we have, I don't know if some of them are here tonight, but we had a a local chess club over in the uh, atrium earlier and after we toured the exhibits with Gary we were able to walk through and see some of the kids playing some chess. They, they didn't break their concentration. They didn't even look up as the <laughs> world champion walked by. They stayed, they stayed focused but there was a real thrill for them as you can imagine just to even be in the same room with, with uh, someone of his stature in a, in a field that they themselves are interested in. Uh, before I invite Gary out I just want to uh, ask you to silence your cell phones and not to take any flash uh, photos or any recording during the, during the uh, uh, presentation. It, it, the, the event is being um, recorded and we'll, there'll be a link to it later so you'll have a chance to, to do that. Um, also, you had on the way in a chance to write a question on a, on a three by five card. If you, if you have just done that now, you can pass those to the side at the, at the end of Gary's uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Sam Ruscha, our supervisory archivist, will um, uh, present some of those questions to Gary uh, so he can um, answer them for you, and we'll, we'll do that during the time that we've, we've allotted for, for this. So I hope, you, I hope you have some questions, and I hope you uh, enjoy tonight's presentation. So without any further ado, please help me in welcoming to the stage and to the Truman Library, Mr. Gary Kasparov.
Mr. Director. Oh, I'm not as tall as you are. <laughs> so let it be my last blunder tonight. Um, thanks to Director Kurt Graham for this kind introduction. It's a great honor to be here. I can only imagine what my die-hard communist grandfather would have made of this. <laughs> Me but instead, I would rather speak today of my die-hard anti-communist father. Because of him, it's very special for me to speak at the presidential library of my illustrious namesake. Yes, believe it not, Harry Truman is not only one of my personal heroes, but he is also the origin of my name, which was quite unusual in the USSR. My father named me for Harry Truman, but it's a hard g sound in Russian. So it's also it's a popular reply promoted by Kremlin allies and appeasers. There are several responses to this fallacy. The first is moral. Do we want to live in a world where a murderous dictator can do whatever he wants because nuclear weapons now exist? That was not the choice of the leaders of the free world for generations. From Truman to Eisenhower, from Kennedy to Reagan, the USSR had nukes too as early as 1949. But America understood it was essential to stand up to communist aggressions everywhere. Stalin was never given a reason to doubt Truman's resolve. Second is the historical fact that Putin, like most dictators, advances and escalates against weaknesses and retreats and bargains against strengths. Making concessions to Putin would make things more dangerous, not less. He doesn't need a deal or an, an off-ramp. He needs a highway to hell. <laughs> we're at this perilous point because warnings were not heeded when Putin first invaded Ukraine in 2014. Showing more weakness would make nuclear confrontation more likely, not less. This is what history tells us and what Truman understood very well. We have forgotten. We must remember. The vocabulary of negotiation is a pleasant and comforting one. It is difficult to argue against civilized concepts like diplomacy and engagement. In contrast, deterrence and isolation are harsh. Negative themes that evoke the dark time of the Cold War and its constant shadow of nuclear confrontation. No one would like less a return to those days than me, or anyone else born and raised behind the Iron Curtain. The question is how best to avoid such a return. If the post-war policies of Harry Truman demonstrate his understanding of any one thing, it is this. Just as there are good wars and bad wars, there is a difference between a good peace and a bad peace. Truman understood that there are things worth fighting for, that there are enemies worth having. The price of Neville Chamberlain's infamous peace for our time with Hitler in 1938 was incredibly high. We are seeing the price of years of engagement, ceasefires, and diplomacy with Vladimir Putin every day in Ukraine. The price of stopping a dictator always goes up with every delay, with every hesitation. The peace mongers' favorite straw man is that the only alternative to appeasement is war, which makes no sense when there's an already an escalating war in progress. The alternative to diplomacy isn't war when it prolongs or worsens existing conflicts and gives the real warmongers a free hand. Deterrence is the alternative to appeasement. Isolation is the alternative to engagement that has only fueled more aggression. Perhaps it's because I grew up in a communist country that I cannot so casually ignore the suffering of the people being left behind as these deals being uh, made. Ronald Reagan was called a warmonger by the same crowd that praised Obama to the skies. And yet, 
Reagan is the one who freed hundreds of millions of people from communist yoke, not the peacemakers Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter. People make jokes about President Biden's age, but he remembers the Cold War, maybe the Civil War. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but Biden remembers the moral clarity of good and evil. Much more must be done for Ukraine, and much more quickly. But Biden understands that it's vital to be right on the big things, unlike his two predecessors, Obama and Trump, if for very different reasons. Obama thought he could declare peace with everyone unilaterally, Cuba, Iran, Russia, but he forgot that it takes two to make peace, and they were not interested, and took advantage. Trump, meanwhile, didn't want to make peace with dictators. He wanted to befriend them and to imitate them. He sees the world the way Putin does. Everything is for self-interest and quid pro quo. Part of being right on the big things is believing that there is no moral equivalence between the free and unfree world. Stop chattering about respecting cultural differences and traditions of cruelty and misery. Individual freedom is better. Democracy is better. Equality under the law is better. Take it from someone who grew up without them. The free world must not apologize or make excuses for doing the right and necessary things. Yes, America has made mistakes, but here you are not punished for talking about them. America is not perfect. But it is still viewed by billions of people around the world as a beacon of hope, because it believes it is possible to always get better. This is why, in 2017, I founded the Renew Democracy Initiative, to connect the fight for democracy at home with the fight against authoritarianism abroad. Our goal at RDI is to remind Americans how inspirational your values truly are to those of us who have experienced life in the unfree world. Never take it for granted. When America is content to play the role of just another bystander, it has a powerful ripple effect. Freedom House 2022 Freedom in the World Report found an overall drop in freedom for the 17th consecutive year. It is no coincidence that this has happened as history's greatest defender of freedom, the United States, abdicated that role for years. Ukraine is where that trend can and must end. The response of the free world has been strong, but we must not grow fatigued. Putin, Xi Jinping, and the other sacks watching hope we will. I reject the tired premise of whether or not the United States should be the global policeman. Global leadership is what is required, not a cop on patrol who occasionally shoots a few bad guys. Leadership means inspiring, aiding, and influencing, and not being afraid to use force when necessary. Courage is the quality that guarantees all the others, as Truman's friend Winston Churchill wrote. But it's not enough on its own. The free world must also use its advantage in strategic thinking, something else Truman demonstrated well beyond the Berlin airlift. Even the most long-lived dictators rarely look beyond tomorrow's battles. It's hard to look into the future when you are always looking over your shoulder. Putin, for example, may well be in too deep in Ukraine, but he cannot slow down at all. He needs more action, more conflict, and more mud in the water instead of pausing to clean up his messes. Democracies, in contrast, can be very slow to act tactically due to their layers of political alliances, public and governmental accountability, not to mention the cautious evaluation of public opinion. The strength of the free world is strategic, not tactical. Common goals, 
political and economic stability, and strong institutions allow for long-term planning and continuity. After World War II, Harry Truman's administration recognized the need for a new set of institutions, mostly to counter Stalin's aggressive USSR. The 1947 Truman's doctrine established a principle of opposing Soviet advances wherever possible. A few short years saw the birth of NATO, the National Security Council, and the CIA, as well as transforming Voice, Voice of America from a wartime radio network into a State Department vehicle. These organizations served their roles well for decades. They are, still exist today, of course, but to different degrees they lost their focus in the post-Cold War world. NATO won't act beyond the letter of its mandate, although it's finally beefing up its defenses along the Russian front due to the demands of justifiably nervous former Soviet bloc nations like Poland and Lithuania. With all its shortcomings, NATO has become a far more effective guarantor of global security than Franklin Roosevelt's brainchild, the United Nations. The UN puts Saudi Arabia, Cuba, and Russia on its Human Rights Council, and would probably be happy to have Russia on its Peace Council if one existed. <laughs> Created to preserve a tense bipolar status quo at the end of World War II, the UN lost its direction in 1991, at the end of the Cold War. It has turned into the ineffectual frozen awards and a cockpit in a Tower of Babel that Churchill warned it might become in his famous Sinews of Peace speech in 1946, 143 miles away from here in Fulton. The end of, call of the Cold War necessitated a new set of institutions, or at least a serious revamping of existing ones. Our institutions may be out of date, but the principles they were built to defend are not. In a mostly overlooked speech in 1951 dedicated to the Fort Chaplin's Chapel in Philadelphia, President Truman defended US military involvement in Korea and elsewhere. He compared it to the attempts to bring law and order to the early days on the American Western frontier. He said, men who wanted to see law and order prevail had to combine against the outlaws. They had to arm themselves. At times, they had to fight. Truman also understood that conceding in small, faraway places would only bring greater conflict later. Quote, our men are in Korea because we are trying to prevent a worldwide war. The men who have died in Korea have died to save us from the terrible slaughter and destruction which another world war would surely bring. End quote. Truman's paternalistic attitude toward the world order and his resolve for the need for American leadership against communism are a little dated, of course. And typically democratic, by the way, not neoconservative. The activist American role after World War II was created and then ex expanded by Democrats, Truman and John F. Kennedy, while Republican Eisenhower tried to slow its growth. JFK's 1961 inaugural is an un unabashed statement of strengths, including the memorable line, we dare not tempt them with weakness. Truman spoke of alliances and partners, but in 1951, everyone knew that if the U US did not lead the fight against Stalin's ambitions, there would be little fight at all. In 2023, NATO still outstrips the forces of the unfree world also, considering how quickly China is expanding its military budget, that might not be true for long. The questions today are not of might, but of mission, will, and leadership. For these questions, too, Truman had an answer in that 1951 speech. Quote, faith has made this country a leader in the world. We shirked our responsibilities in the 1920s. We cannot shirk now. Good leaders do not threaten to quit if things go wrong. They expect cooperation, of course, and they expect everyone to do his share, but they do not stop to measure sacrifices with a teaspoon 
while the fight is on. Apparently, spending time with Churchill had had an impact on the rhetoric of the usually plain spoken man from Missouri. <laughs> the flowery language was atypical, but Truman had always shared Churchill's commitment to defending freedom wherever it was threatened, and that only by so doing could larger conflicts be avoided. And while the appeasement crowd today is always eager to discuss Vietnam and the 2003 Iraq war, they prefer to ignore the shining example of Korea. In 2015, I visited the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea as part of a Human Rights Foundation project. We were sending balloons across the border. From the vantage point on the river, the importance of Truman's courage is as visible as the light and dark divide that splits the thriving democracy of South Korea from the gulag of Kim Jong-un. The Korean people's fight against communist aggression was supported by the United States, and 50 million South Koreans today live in freedom because of that support. By the way, Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan are excellent refutations of the theory that some people are not ready for or capable of democracy. I often hear that about Russians, how we love a strong man. It's in our genes or something stupid. North Koreans and South Koreans or Taiwanese and Chinese mainlanders, same people. But one group has the opportunity to be free thanks largely to the United States and Harry Truman. This Samsung phone is a handy example what free people can achieve thanks to the leadership of Truman and the great sacrifice of the American people. No action goes exactly as planned. Trust me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Even the best preparation could still lead you in some sort of trouble. There will, there will be always setbacks and failures, often with tragic consequences. Criticize America's results in Vietnam and Iraq, certainly, and learn from what went wrong. But I was born in a totalitarian country, and I cannot condemn the effort to defend the lives and freedom of people resisting autocracy or to mourn the demise of dictators like Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi. It is absurd to expect peace and democracy to immediately flower in deserts that have known only brutal dictatorship for so long. But this is, isn't an argument taking, against taking action. It's an argument to act sooner and to do better. Inaction is also a choice. Inaction can also kill. The United States must still lead. And here we come to one last line from Truman's speech, a sentence that stopped me cold when I first read it. The voice of history calls from that Philadelphia chapel where Truman proclaimed 72 years ago, we cannot lead the forces of freedom from behind. Today, we hear what we should not do. That we should worry about what Putin or Xi Jinping might do. Truman was facing a much more powerful threat in Stalin. And he had the exact opposite stance. He knew the free world had to unite and find common purpose to defend itself and its values. He knew it was necessary because of what Stalin would do if we did not. Mostly, Truman wanted Stalin and the rest of the world to worry about what Truman might do. And they did. Ah, Truman was, of course, a poker player, not a chess player. <laughs> but poker is perhaps a better game for politics. You never take anything off the table the way the free world so often does today. You don't let a weaker opponent bluff you, 
as Putin has so often done successfully against indecisive Western leaders. Ukraine is the current battlefield of the war between freedom and tyranny. But it will not end in Ukraine if Putin can claim any victory at all. China is watching carefully to see if America will fight to defend the world order and innocent lives the way President Truman did 75 years ago. The outcome of this epic battle in Ukraine will impact the course of the world for generations. This is not a question of what Gary say, but rather what would Harry do? <laughs> I think we know the answer. Harry S. Truman would fight and fight to win. Thank you. Mr. Kasparov, thank you very much for your talk uh, and, uh, tonight, and thanks for joining us uh, this evening. I have some questions here from the audience uh, that I will I'll ask you, uh, if you will. Uh, the first question is, in what ways has your decision to be an anti-Russian government activist impacted your daily, everyday life? Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's uh, just to, let me begin with saying that uh, I'm not opposing just Russian government. I'm opposing any dictatorship anywhere in the world. Now, as for my daily life, when in 2005 I decided to end my professional chess career and to move into this um, shady world of Russian politics, I wanted, among many other things, for my kids to grow up in a free country. They are in the United States because I had to move to New York after facing imminent arrest in 2013. So I guess it answers part of the question. Um, as for other elements of my daily life, so I have uh, to um, be very selective about countries I'm visiting. Um, I don't have bodyguards in my normal life, so just I think it's just it's it's a waste of time and, and resources. So if they want to get you, that's you know. You can. Uh, but I live in New York, not in London. <laughs> um, and uh, and there are countries that I you know I have to cross you know just from my travel list, and uh, I have to say that though I in my life that was rich with travel, I visited way over 100 countries. So now the list probably is down to 20 or, or so. Uh, that's, and this list doesn't include even some of the uh, European countries like Hungary. Again, it's this, I'm not blaming Orban for trying to sell me down the river, but, uh, but I don't want to visit countries where KGB has just, you know, just has a green light for their actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question comes to us. Uh, what are the chances that Putin will be overthrown by the Russian military? <laughs> the question is 50% correct. I think he will be overthrown by the military, but by Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, just you know, a little bit, you know, just, just, just an again, historical uh, parallel, just looking at the World War II. Because tragically, and I have to confess it as Russian, my country today is some kind of the 
replica of Nazi Germany of 1943-1944. My compatriots uh, have been committing heinous crimes on Ukrainian soil, not seen in Europe uh, since World War II. I have to say that it's probably the worst genocide since World War II. There you people can point out at Cambodia, at Rwanda, and a few other places. But it's the first genocide that we can see online. Dr. Goebbels was not promoting uh, gas chambers on radio. Uh, Cambodia, Pol Pot was not you know, just uh, sending pictures of, of, of uh, uh, thousands of people killed by his henchmen to the news agencies. Putin does every day. They are celebrating another hate to Ukrainian apartment block. Uh, and they, they know they cannot win the war on the battlefield. They want to outsuffer Ukraine. They believe they can go on with this war forever and uh, for a long time. And then Ukrainians will run out of manpower. The West will run out of political will, resources. Maybe the next winter will be a harsh one. And while Europe will be freezing without Russian gas, God knows what happens. Again, it's a war of attrition. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the only way to take Russian people out of the zombie status is for Ukraine to win the war. We have to go through our 1945 moment. Now, without occupation, without bombs dropped in Russian cities, but people of my country, majority of them, must realize that the empire is dead. The idea of the empire is dead. And the only thing it happens, it's when the Ukrainian flag is raised in Sevastopol. And that will be the end of Putin. That will be the beginning of liberation of my country from Putin's fascism. Thank you, thank you. A question here from one of the young chess players in the audience. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite part about chess? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think we all need luck in our life because I believe talent exists everywhere. And I, I wonder what would have happened with me if not for that winter night in Baku, I have not glanced at the chess board set up by my parents who tried to solve a uh, a chess puzzle from a newspaper. I mean, judging from the average age of the audience, I think you remember the newspapers with chess, <laughs> <laughs> with chess diagrams. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, and I was fascinated. I, just, I looked at these pieces, and I, I didn't know how to move the pieces, but I learned the, the rules by just watching them, trying to find a solution. It's 55 years later, I'm still very much in love with the game. So that's why it's a long story. So, but, <laughs> but whatever I, I, I do now, so I always like to, to just to play a game or to on the internet or to watch others because I'm, I'm an amateur. I'm the strongest amateur on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still an amateur, yes. And, uh, and nothing gives me a great joy by watching, watching chess. It just, it's, a, it's a routine. And what advice would you have to a young player or any uh, person who wants to get better at the game? The, uh, I'm not a professional coach, but I think there's, there's no, no secret, there's no magic pill you can take and get a better player. You have to work hard, you have to love the game, and, uh, and if you have this talent, so that's just, it, will, it will manifest. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, again, it's, it's a great game, but there are many other great games. That's, the, that's, a, that's a problem. These days, we have, we have to compete with thousands and thousands of uh, other games. Uh, but what makes me feel really happy is to see how many kids are playing chess. That chess is less popular today than when Fischer played Spassky or when I played Karpov, because while chess grew up almost exponentially, but the problem is that the world of entertainment grew up one million times bigger. Much bigger territory. It's, this is, and many more people playing chess today. But when you look at the big picture and all the games that are available, so we are just taking very little spot. So, but again, the numbers are just, you know, are just demonstrating uh, uh, that game has been gaining popularity, and uh, I'm, I'm, I, I see no shortage of talent. Uh, though again, it's now spread around the world. I know there's no single country that dominates. Uh, the world of chess as, as was in the old Soviet days. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. 
another question, uh, getting back to the geo geopolitics here. Uh, should Truman have risked starting World War III over Berlin? I think I answered in, in, my, in my speech because, yes, it was a calculated risk. You play poker. But it's statistically. What would be uh, uh, less risky or more risky? To let Stalin take Berlin? Because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a game who blinks first. Um, Truman was busy building an, an alliance. And he had to show to Europeans he would defend them. I mean, let's not forget. You know, the America had to go through a very painful process before, during World War I and, and before World War II, before joining the Allies. And uh, if US president shown weakness in 1946, 1947, it would probably leave Europe you know, at Stalin's mercy. So it's just Truman believed that he had no choice. So again, but it's, but, but it's not that he was you know, taking risk all the time. Again, he was a gambler, but he calculated risk. So when having a little tour around the museum, just I discussed with, with, with Kurt the, uh, some of the big moments. In many, in many places in the world, so Truman is seen just, or just or remembered as somebody who dropped the bombs. Uh, and many other things that are far more important, they're just being you know, just ignored. And by the way, dropping the bombs probably made an impression on Stalin. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Um, but again, uh, it's the it's. But I think it's important to remember the moment where Truman decided against dropping the bomb, which was November December 1950, when General MacArthur was pushing hard and wanted to go into Chinese territory, and that would lead to a war, which probably Stalin wanted at the time because he already had nukes and he was not happy with the outcome because he, was, he could see clearly that he was losing this battle to Truman. His plans to, to spread communism, yeah, they won China, but they lost m m uh, many places in Europe, they lost Turkey, they lost Greece, so, and, and uh, they, they saw Japan as being uh, rebuilt. So, and Truman decided against escalation. So I think it's just, you know, as, as a poker player, you know, he was a really good one. And I wish, you know, we had, you know, this kind of talent um, among Western leaders in the last 20 years. Yeah, because this is, that's, I remember that I, I just, I use this poker analogy uh, uh, when we, when I was asked about uh, Putin playing chess. Because my instant re reaction to, to the words Putin playing chess is always to defend the integrity of my game. <laughs> and I instinctively shifted to poker, saying it's about, you know, playing the game where you can bluff and win with a weak hand. So, and I remember, you know, this, this, this uh, tragic moment, I believe a tragic moment of, of Obama not, you know, uh, not punishing Assad for crossing this infamous red line, which I believe would be the beginning of, of, of a disaster, both on the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, so I said it as it's like uh, Putin played, you know, with a weak hand, but he bluffed. You know, he had, uh, he had uh, uh, um, two pairs, and he acted as if he had a, a, a row flash. And Obama had a full house and flashed in the toilet. <laughs> so it's, it's the, again, it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand that you, know, that you have to take certain risk at the time. Yeah, and, uh, and again, dealing with Putin, Xi Jinping, and others, you have to consider there's a risk. But, but it's again, again, many people probably remember 1962. So how did we get, come to this very perilous moment? Because in, at the first meeting was Khrushchev, Kennedy showed weakness. And Khrushchev said, ah, ah, I can just twist him. And then he had to show strength. And what's happened? Khrushchev backed off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do you think Putin is trying to wait out the West in Ukraine as Stalin tried to wait out Truman in Berlin? Um, you know, we, there are clear parallels between Putin, Stalin, Putin, Hitler, uh, but there's one fundamental difference. Stalin and Hitler, they had ideology behind them. Horrible ideas, just threatening democracy, humanity, but they had ideas, they had a plan. Putin is different. Putin's uh, uh, dictatorship is a strange mixture of, of um, ideology and, and, and sheer power. It's, I always said that 
you know, studying Putin, you have to look for Mario Putz, a godfather, rather than the, the books of political pundits. Uh, it's, a, it's a mafia state. Um, uh, and Putin could be treated as Kappa the Tutti Kappa. Um, but territorial conquest was also an important element because it could extend his power. I think Putin's war in Ukraine, in his eyes, was a culmination of his war against the free world. He couldn't accept the idea or the reality uh, of the post-World War II where, you know, we had to negotiate, sign treaties. No, it's might is right. That's the way Putin sees the world. And every concession made by the free world convinced him that he could go further and further and further. I always say that dictators never ask why, it's always why not. And that's what Putin expected. Uh, when somebody tells you that Putin made a huge mistake by is deciding to invade Ukraine in February 2022, though he already started the war in 2014 by annexing Crimea and, and, and uh, um, starting this, this the, uh, uh, crisis uh, and, and, and local war in, in, in the east of Ukraine. Uh, my response to this, uh, to this analysis is, is asking, wait a second, what, what was wrong? Putin based his decision on experience that he accumulated over 22 years. Um, now imagine for a moment, God forbid, he had succeeded to take over Kiev in four days as he expected. And by the way, I see I predicted. So, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Europe and had a very prominent audience with few heads of governments and foreign ministers sitting. And looking into their eyes, I said, guys, tell me that I'm wrong. Putin takes over Kyiv, puts puppet government that you would not negotiate with government. Silence. That's what Putin expected. That, and, um, American response, do you remember what America did in the first two days of the war? Ah, just can remind you, they suggested, kindly suggested Zelensky to leave, to evacuate uh, him, his family, and the government. He could have taken the chance, the history could be different, but again, it's another proof of the wisdom of the crowd. Many of you remember when 72% of Ukrainians elected a comedian their president, many laughed. Huh? But at the greatest moment, he proved to be up to the challenge. Responding to this kind American offer was a phrase of Winston Churchill caliber. I don't need a right, I need an ammunition. He would be killed with his family if Putin succeeded. And Ukraine prevailed, defending Kyiv, taking back some territories, and now trying, even with the limited supply they receive from the free world, to take back their country. So um, it's, um, and it's, it's, it's I, I'm incorrigible optimist by nature. The problem that is these days, you know, I find it's very difficult morally for me as being Russian to, to remain optimistic because uh, every inch of territory taken back by Ukrainians is is paid by their blood. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a sad, a sad irony that there's a big debate now about whether Ukraine should or should not join NATO. NATO was built in 1949 with one goal and one purpose only, to defend free Europe against Soviet Russian invasion. Yes, since 1949, the frontier of free Europe moved from River Rhine to River Dnieper. The principle is still the same. And Ukraine has been fighting this very war that NATO was built for alone. Oh, there's plenty of techno te te weapons and ammunition, but, but it's still, they have to pay in, 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 in highest currency, which is, which is blood. So I think, let's just go back to what I said 30 minutes ago, we have everything except political will. 
and recognition that the, it's, this is the war of principles, the war of values. And these wars cannot, be, cannot end at negotiating table. Never before we had a war of that magnitude, ideological magnitude, to end up at negotiating table. World War II has not ended at negotiating table. Actually, in this country, probably worth rem remembering, civil war has not ended at negotiating table. Thanks God. There was a huge pressure on Lincoln to end up war at negotiating table and to save lives. Yeah, you remember, unconditional surrender. That's, 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 that's what, even at very high cost, pushed this country into the future and made this country a better place. And I can also recall in 1943 in Casablanca at the conference of Allied Conference, Roosevelt and Churchill under his, Roosevelt's pressure uh, proclaimed the goals of the war, unconditional surrender. And again, remember, 1943, January, the Battle of Stalingrad was not over. Japan was still strong. Italy was in the war. German troops were standing on the banks of Volga all the way west to Atlantic, to Shores Atlantic. Unconditional surrender. And when today I hear, well, we will stand with Ukraine as long as it takes. Somehow, just, you know, my English probably is not that good. Somehow, just it bothers me. Why not simply say Ukraine must win? Uh, one last question, sir, uh, and it's on a, a chess topic, and, and on a light note here. Uh, four words. Did Deep Blue cheat? <laughs> I, uh, um, I can say that is the, it's in, uh, just, a, just a side story. So actually, it's, uh, 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 it's four words. It was a title of my speech I delivered in Berlin back in 2015. That was not about chess, of course. Uh, I didn't even probably mention Deep Blue. Uh, um, it's in Aspen Institute. And there was an idea that four words can change the world. I mentioned already uh, two, of this war, two, two of these four words, uh, peace for our time. We will stay periods. And of course, we can add two more uh, four words phrases by US presidents that made a huge impact. Ich bin ein Berliner. OK, now back to the blue. Um, look, um, when the match was over, so I was very angry. For one of the reasons, it was not the first match I lost to a machine. It was the first match I lost, period. Uh, it was very painful. Um, there were problems with the machine not being properly supervised. Uh, and there were moments where I was not uh, confident that uh, there was no outside interference. Frankly speaking, 26 years later, I don't care. <laughs> You know, uh, it's the, at the last, you know, just it's uh, when I resigned in the last game and just went to this press conference and I thought, oh, that's the, that's, that's, that's the end. That's what will happen with me, with my beloved game. And uh, it will be, it, it's a curse. It will stay with me for the rest of my life. You know what? Now I think it was blessing. Yeah, it's just, now I can go around. Uh, just, you know, it's, everybody asks me about the blue and AI. I mean, by the way, Deep Blue was not intelligent. It was as intelligent as your alarm clock. <laughs> it didn't have to be intelligent as any machine because it's all about making fewer mistakes than we do. But, but because I play Deep Blue and I'm the first knowledge worker who had his job threatened by a machine, I'm a welcome guest to every conference. <laughs> and, uh, and I can actually defend the idea that machines are not threatening our very existence because I lost the match. So that's, that gives me an alibi to, to, to attack Elon Musk and other doomsayers who are threatening the end of the world with you know, this chat, chat GPT and other things. So it's a long story. It's a different lecture. Yes, but um, uh, the answer is it it's remains, you know, that's, that's, it's one of the mysteries. So um, uh, what, can I what I can tell you that 
the match, the quality of the games in this match was pretty low. If you have a chess app on your device, it's as good or even better than Deep Blue, just to understand today. So, uh, and of course, if you have a chess engine to download on your computer, that's, the, that's much better than Magnus Carlsen. Much, much better. So there's no, there's no comparison. The, the difference between the chess engine that you can download on your computer and, and the strongest chess player on the planet is the same as about uh, between uh, Usain Bolt and Ferrari. <laughs> First 50 yards, they will be on par. <laughs> <laughs> then, good luck. Um, so um, I, uh, uh, I feel today that you know I was... Um, mm, I was a lucky man to be part of this experiment. That's the way I saw it. And I think it was a great experiment. I don't think that IBM you know, uh, um, played a fair game by, not, I'm not talking about cheating, by refusing me to play the next match. Because you probably remember that I won the first one, just for the sake, for the record. <laughs> In 1996, I won the first one, and I just, you know, I immediately accepted the rematch offer. So then I also wanted to play the real rematch, the rubber match. Ah, they said, no, you know what? We just, we, we decided to retire the blue. <laughs> and just to, to, to make it on a, on a positive note, so if you fly to New York, you can always find the blue now in JFK Airport. Uh, Terminal 5 is making sushi there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow, what an evening. You know, Gary, we at the Truman Library have brought to this audience so many scholars and experts and elected officials to talk about this topic and many others, but we have rarely had the opportunity to hear from someone who's actually lived it. And we so appreciate the insight and the perspective you brought to us tonight. Before we came out here, you told me that you had come here very intentionally to pay honor to your hero, Harry Truman. And I'd just like to say I think you've done your hero very proud here.